we have a really um, special and courageous guest with us today, Gideon Levy. Um, and this is my last event, um, our last event, as co-presidents of Oxford Speaks. And I find that to be quite deeply satisfying. Um, summarizing Gideon's life and career in a few short sentences is very difficult, but I'll give it a try. Um, Gideon was born in 1953 in Tel Aviv. His grandparents were murdered in the Holocaust, which both of his parents fled, emigrating eventually to Israel. He described himself as having held mainstream views on Israeli politics in his youth, and he was drafted into the IDF in 1974, and served as an aide to Shimon Peres, then the leader of the Israeli Labour Party, from 1978 to 1982. In the early 1980s, he joined Haaretz, and he's written for the newspaper ever since. Throughout his decades-long journalistic career, Gideon has covered the Israeli-Palestine conflict, and in particular, the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, with unparalleled incisiveness. His column, Twilight Zone, which he began writing in 1988, has described Palestinian life in the occupied territories, and his book, The Punishment of Gaza, originally published in 2010, tells the story of a strip deeply affected by occupation, despite the oft-claimed withdrawal in 2005. He was awarded the Olaf Palm Prize in 2016, which he shared with the Palestinian pastor Mitri Raheb, and in 2021 he won the Sokolov Prize. And when preparing you know, for this event and reading about Gideon I, was, Gideon, I was reminded of a speech given by Robert F. Kennedy in Cape Town as South Africa was entering its third decade of apartheid. And in a not so thinly veiled remark, he observed that few men are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, and the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rare commodity in bravery and battle. It is the one essential vital quality for those who seek to change the world, which yields most painfully to change. This world demands the qualities of youth, not as a time of life, but as a state of mind, the temper of the will, the quality of the imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, and an appetite for adventure over a life of ease. Gideon, in my view, has embodied that spirit of youth throughout his career, and it's a real honor to host him here today. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Sam. I mean, the best thing would be now to say goodbye because from here it can get only worse. <laughs> so let's uh, stop here. I'm not sure I need this thing. Oh, great. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be back in Oxford. And it's a great honor for me to be with your lecture club. By the time we went to sleep last night, around the uh, 1 o'clock Palestine time, 11 o'clock Israel time, something like 8,000 uh, replaced people in Gaza went to sleep on mattresses in a school in the Nusrat refugee camp. <coughs> there are around 8,000 people in this school, all of them uh, refugees, part of them second time and third time. And by the time, many children obviously, by the time they went to sleep, there were three attacks, not one or two, three attacks from the air. And at least 40 bodies were counted. To the hospital, El Quds in Dir el Bala, in the last 24 hours, they were brought at least 70 bodies. The scenes of children dying on the grounds, on the bloody grounds of the hospital, because there are no beds, obviously, were heartbreaking, like any similar scenes in the last eight months. Israel didn't see those scenes. Israel saw nothing of those scenes. I would like to talk today not about what's going on in Gaza, because I have the feeling that most of you know quite a lot and, and saw quite a lot and I don't think I have to describe here what's going on in Gaza. <coughs> I'd rather talk more, not only, but more about what's going on inside Israel. Because the fate of Gaza, as usual, is in the hands of Israel. And Israel is the core, the core player in this very, very cruel cool game. On the 7th of October, it was a holiday. I was uh, 
jogging like I used to jog almost every day. Very, very slow, don't have any fantasies for an athlete. Always the last in any convoy. And uh, at 6.30 it was, I was in the Hyalcon Park next to my home. At 6.30 there was a siren. Quite astonishing because we didn't hear sirens for many months now. We are used to sirens, but this was quite unexpected. There was no place to go and somehow I thought maybe it's a technical problem. A few minutes later there was the second siren and then I thought this is serious. I went home. Uh, still, I thought I can still make it to the swimming pool. I went to the swimming pool. And then after a few uh, pools, they told me, go home, we are closing the swimming pool. This was the beginning for me. I came home, my neighbors, who always know everything, they already showed me videos from Sederot, which is a town in the south of Israel, by the border with Gaza, with two uh, pickup trucks with uh, armed Palestinians standing on them. I was sure this is fake news being taken in Afghanistan. My arrogance, my built-in arrogance as an Israeli, as a, I have to admit it, didn't give me even room to believe that the Palestinian can penetrate into the road. I saw the barrier they built for billions of dollars just a few months before. Oh, no way that it is, those were Palestinians. And then on Saturday, I always write my, my column for Sunday. And I wrote uh, what I felt. And I'll be very honest with you. I felt that the Berlin Wall fall. And I felt some kind of joy, I must say, like many people in the world felt when the Berlin Wall fall. And I sent my article. But soon later, my editor called me and said, listen, there are terrible atrocities being taking place in the South. We didn't know yet what's going on. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of people killed, destruction, fire, kidnapping. You cannot compare it to the Berlin Wall. And I totally agreed, and I changed my article. And it was dedicated only to the Israeli arrogance, namely that we are living like this for at least 56 years, if not 76 years, in the feeling that we have the right to do whatever we want, that nobody can stop us, that we are, the more, we are possessing the most moral army in the world, and we can continue our lives, which are quite good, life in Israel is quite good, when one hour away from our homes, not more than one hour drive away from our homes, there is one of the most brutal regimes on earth, and I insist, one of the most brutal regimes in the world is ruling, oppressing another people one hour away from our homes, and still we can feel so good about ourselves without having any moral doubts, and we can continue like this forever. This was broken on the 7th of October. And the Israeli arrogant, and this is what I wrote on the 8th of October, sorry for uh, quoting myself, but in the Israeli current media, there are very few others that I can quote now, we'll get to it. In any case, the Israeli arrogance led us to this, and I will not get too much into it. And then on the 7th, I didn't understand it yet, started a new era, nothing but a new era. New era in the Middle East, new era in Palestine, and also a new era in Israel. And this is very dramatic, because I'm not sure it is reversible. The last remains of the Israeli peace camp, or whatever it was, were totally crashed on the 7th of October. Almost all the Israelis that I know, not the right wingers, We'll get to them. But the mainstream, the leftists, the peaceniks, the, the socialists, the good Israelis, those that we love, those that we like, almost all of them 
went through a terrible turmoil on the 7th of October and the days after, and got to the conclusion that after what happened on this day, and on this day there were crimes being taken place, have no doubt about it and don't put any doubts about it. Because I've been in the kibbutzim two days later, I saw what's going on, it was horrible. But after what happened, from now on, Israel has the ultimate try to do whatever it wants in order to punish Gaza. We have the full <coughs> right and duty not only to punish Hamas, to punish Gaza, to destroy, to kill without any restraints. And don't you dare to tell us, you, the world, that we don't have this right. Because after what they have done to us, everything will be forgotten from now on, international law, morality, whatever, you name it, the international community, we are going to do whatever we want. And a few days later started the most brutal and cruel war of Israel over Gaza, or shall I say, the most brutal and cruel attack of Israel on Gaza, because it's not really a war between two well-equipped armies, it is a full-scale attack of Israel on Gaza, which in the eyes of almost all Israelis has a full justification. Until this very moment, most of the Israelis are against stopping the war, even now, even now after eight months. Tomorrow, I think it's, what's, what's the day today? It's not tomorrow. Tomorrow it's eight months. Tomorrow we're celebrating eight months. In those eight months, so many things changed in Israel. But before I elaborate on this, I just want to get to the bottom line. The bottom line from the point of view of Israel. Israel didn't gain any of its goals in this war. Israel is today in a much worse situation from any aspect than eight months ago. Militarily, economically, diplomatically, internationally, Israel is today a pariah state in, in terms that we understand that this is just the beginning. What people like me were hoping for many years, I must admit it, that the world will wake up and understand that only the international community can put an end to what's going on in Palestine, the world woke up, but not enough, but we are witnessing a beginning. But Israel from itself, from inside, totally crashed. No peace camp, not only no peace camp, the remains of what Israel, what was one of the strongest assets of Israel, namely that it is the only democracy in the Middle East, and it was a democracy for Jewish citizens, no doubt about it. But you can't be half pregnant and you can't be half democratic. But we were democratic for our Jewish citizens, like, by the way, South Africa was quite democratic toward the 9% whites. Very similar. There were elections, there was free press, but only among the 9%. <coughs> This democracy for the Jewish people started to really be crushed. And today we are facing a situation in which I don't remember in Israel ever, in which people are afraid to not only to say their views, to express their emotions. You cannot express any kind of empathy in Israel toward the Palestinians. You cannot express any empathy toward the 15,000 children which were massacred. When you say the word tevach in Israel, massacre, and they use it 100 times a day, when you say massacre, you mean the 7th of October. This is the massacre, and there is no other massacre in the last eight months. Don't you dare to call the killings of 36,000 people massacre. You have the right to call only the killing of 1,200 people as a message. Don't you dare to feel empathy with the Palestinians. 
always the victims, always the children. If you are Jewish, it might be bearable. If you are an Israeli Palestinian citizen, you might find yourself in jail. And those are concrete things which happened. Any Palestinian Israeli who dared to say a word of empathy, dare to call for ending the war, dare to say anything which sounds as if there are some emotions to those people who are killed and, and replaced and starving, would find himself either in jail or fired from his job, including in the academia, or maybe even mainly in the academia. This is unprecedented in Israel, that its strongest asset, the fact that we are a liberal democratic society, this image, was it true or not, but this image was totally crashed in this war, and we are facing now a new situation in which people are scared to say what they think, and people are scared to publish their opinions, mainly if they are Israeli-Palestinians, then they are also scared to breathe, they're really scared to breathe. And we have to thank for all this, first of all, and above all, to the Israeli media. And therefore, I want to say some words about the Israeli media. The Israeli media is a free media, most of it, almost all of it, almost all of it, private owned, commercial, quite liberal. They can. Uh, publish investigations about the president, the prime minister, ministers, politicians. They brought a president, a prime minister to jail in Israel, which very few medias, even in the West, did. But the press, it's, the Israeli press, is the main factor in, in Israeli democratic life and had some really meaningful results. I understand that you had Eud Olmert here. Eud Olmert went to jail mainly because the media was revealing all kinds of things about his corruption. Same about the president of the state who went to, to prison for rape and many other brave stories. But Israeli media throughout the years was the biggest collaborator with Israel's occupation. But it was bearable somehow until the 7th of then the Israeli media go to a place which is the biggest betray that the media can commit. I can't find sharp enough words to describe you the role of the Israeli media. We are always laughing at the Russian media <coughs> how they cover the war in Ukraine. The Israeli media is by far more criminal because the Israeli media has a choice. The Russian media does not have a choice. And being self-censored is always much worse than to be censored. The Israeli media is not censored. You can still write whatever you want. Nobody, I mean, the government the, the, can do very little, if at all, to silence you. But the media silence itself. And that's so disappointing and that's so depressing. The Israeli average viewer or newspaper reader knows by far much less than each of you about what's going on in Gaza. He saw much less than you saw about Gaza. Israel is in one ritual ever since the 7th of October. There is only one ritual in Israel and you cannot suggest anything more. The ritual of victimization the ritual of the kidnapped, the hostages, the ritual of their families, the rituals of the killed soldiers, all very strong traumas. I don't underestimate them. But there is no room whatsoever to the Palestinian victims, to the Palestinian agony, to the Palestinian suffer, to the starvation. The dehumanization of the Palestinians in this war reached a, a, a point in the media, reached a point that 
even the Israeli media, which had the world record of dehumanizing the Palestinians, never reached before. Never reached before. I once say that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, it's not a provocation, I really believe so. If Israel would have gone to Gaza in a campaign to kill 35,000 dogs in Gaza, I can tell you the Israeli media would have been much more stoned. Israel public opinion would, would go to the streets in very aggressive demonstrations and the killing would have stopped. But killing 35,000 civilians, at least 70% of them, totally innocent, children, women, I don't have to describe it here, is a non-issue in Israel. It's a non-issue. It's not discussed at all. You see demonstrations in Israel. Yes, there are very devoted demonstrations in Israel. They have two goals, to get rid of Netanyahu and to release the hostages. Both are very legitimate and important goals. But there is not one, or I don't want to say one, but there is hardly a demonstration which calls to stop the war because, because of its crimes. Nothing by this, but this. Now Israelis start to suffer because of what seems to be beginning of sanctions, grey sanctions on Israel. They say it's not very pleasant to be an Israeli traveling abroad. But not because it's not very pleasant to belong to a people who commit all those crimes, but because the world looks at us in a bad way. And the world looks at us as it looks only for one reason. You know what's the reason? Not because of what we are doing. Because the world is anti-Semite. Because the world will always be against Israel, whatever Israel does. And therefore it's the world's fault and not ours. There is even not a beginning of a thought in Israel that maybe, maybe something is also wrong with what we are doing. There is only a blame game. The world is anti-Semite. Palestinians don't mention. They anyhow are not perceived as human beings, and we are still the victims. And the only victims. Can you believe it after this war, for an average Israeli, not only the Israelis are the victims, they are the only victims now. There are no other victims. See? You'll scratch under the skin of every Israeli, almost every Israeli, and you'll get the same answer. We are victims. This war was forced on us. We don't want to kill. We don't want to destroy. It's all forced on us. All the old songs that we know now for decades to justify what cannot be justified. Now, why does the media hide the catastrophe of Gaza? And you know, when I say hide, some of you study relevant topics like journalism, etc. And you know that it's all about the framing. It's not that you will not find here and there a piece of news about the figures of killed Palestinians. Here and there you will hear about the school which was bombed yesterday. But the framing is a framing of not important and not interesting. You know the media is always going between those two poles, what is important, what is interesting, there are things which are important and interesting, there are things which are only important, which, there are things like gossip which are only interesting, and there are those things which are neither important nor interesting. This is the story of Gaza, neither important nor interesting. And the media does so only for one reason, nobody told it to do so, only for one reason, not to bother the readership and the viewers, to please them. To let them feel so good about themselves. To let this unbelievable ritual of victimization go on. And you see Israeli TV and you open Israeli newspapers and it is 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, again and again, only one thing. 
our victims. They don't exist others. I don't even say that it should be equal. Every nation, every people cares first of all about its own victims. This is very human. But not on the cost of total lack of knowledge and information about what you are doing to the other. And therefore you'll find most of the Israelis today in a very heavy mood. There is a heavy mood in Israel. There is like clouds, very dark clouds on the sky. Nothing is certain anymore. Again, people are asking this question, will Israel exist in 50 years? Which is not being asked in any other country in the world. It shouldn't be asked in Israel. Right? And above all, there is total focus on what happened to us and no interest whatsoever in what we are doing to the other. Media that behaves like this betrays its profession before anything else. And it's very hard to break it. And the outcome is very clear. Full support in the war until this very moment. No guilt feelings, no hesitations, doubts about what we are doing in Gaza. Full confidence that the army is doing its job because it is a very moral army. Full confidence that the international law does not apply to Israel. It does apply to any other country in the world, not to Israel because we are a special case. Full convinced conviction that the world is just waiting to harm Israel because the world is anti semite And here I come to what people should think here or sh should take into account. I was asked before I came in here, how do we deal with this challenge that every criticism about Israel is immediately labeled as anti-Semitism? People here also, in other countries in Europe even more so, are afraid to raise their voice. Because immediately they will be labeled as anti-Semites. And who wants to be an anti-Semite? Or at least to be labeled like this. This is the biggest success of Israeli propaganda in the last decade. Labeling any criticism as anti-Semitism. And it works like hell. Europe is paralyzed. Europe is paralyzed. It's very hard to criticize Israel. Now the campuses, the young generation, the United States, the campuses in the United States are starting to shake this conviction. But still, people are very, very cautious and careful not to criticize Israel in order to not to be blamed as anti-Semites. Now, anti-Semitism exists, and anti-Semitism should be fought. But not every criticism on Israel is anti-Semitic. And any one of us, every one of us, know very well if you are an anti-Semite or not. And if you are convinced that you are not, let them call you anti-Semites. It's not your right to criticize Israel. It is the duty of every person of conscience in the world today to raise its voice against Israel. I was going around today with my friend Tammy here in Oxford and I saw the two tent camps that are standing here with the Palestinian flags and I was happy and sad. I was happy to see it and I was very sad to think why there are no, no camps like this in Israel and then I thought what would happen if there would be such a camp in Israel. It will be burned within minutes and all the participant, participants will be taken to jail. No doubts about it. You can't even raise the Palestinian flag in Israel. It's not a legitimate flag even though it's recognized by so many countries in the world. So we face a problem now with the society in Israel. And the conclusion is very clear. Don't expect change from within Israel. It will not come. Stop believing that the Israeli society will fix itself by itself. What happened in South Africa will not happen in Israel. It will not come from within. 
in South Africa, by the way, there were so many Jews, members of the Jewish community, who not only paid solidarity with the, with the blacks, part of them fought with them, part of them were jailed with them, part of them even died and were injured with the blacks for a struggle which was not for the Jewish community, it was for their fellow South Africans, the black ones. <coughs> I don't expect this in Israel, obviously. But the fact that Israel is in this coma, Israel is in, the Israeli society is right now in coma. The fact that Israel is in such a coma should lead us to the conclusion not to expect any change there, not to expect anything which will come from within Israel. The Israelis will not wake up one shining morning and say, oh, this occupation, oh, this apartheid state, we don't like it, let's put an end to it. It will never happen. It will happen only, and even this is not guaranteed, it will happen only if Israelis will start to feel the occupation and the apartheid by being punished, by having to pay, by being forced to be accountable to what is being done on our behalf. And this can happen only after an international intervention. This will never happen otherwise. The Palestinians and the Arab states cannot get into it without the backing of the world. It's only the world who can really make a change. And unfortunately, we had so many disappointments with the world, including now. Russia invaded into Ukraine. Within weeks, there were sanctions. Within weeks. Can you believe it? Russia, within weeks, sanctions. Someone even dares to mention the word sanction in the context of Israel? after what we are witnessing now, after all those years, but also after what we are witnessing now. Nothing. So we have an American administration which means, maybe means for the good, but still believes in the old way of convincing Israel and tempting Israel and giving advices to Israel and giving uh, some kind of warnings and condemnations. Long time that Israel knows to ignore all this. It never worked. Why should Israel, why would it work now? American president who, who speaks about ending the war and in the very same day adds more ammunition and more arms that he's sending to Israel. An American president who warns Israel not to penetrate into Rafa. He was very clear about it. And Israel is deep in Rafa, and the weapons continue to stream to Israel. And so it will continue. So the only change I can foresee right now must come from civil societies. Nothing but, but this. It must start in the universities, in the campuses, in all kind of unions and organizations in the civil society. And it is starting, but it's very slow. And only from there it will penetrate to the governments. And from the governments, and obviously it must be led by the United States, because that's the power game of the world. Only there. That's on one hand quite, and one hope, one's quite hopeful because the students in Harvard, in, in Columbia, in UCLA, in all those campuses are tomorrow's politicians, at least at the Democratic Party. But you really think that the Palestinians can wait for another generation to make the change? None of us, let me say only this sentence about the Palestinians, None of us in this room, unless he is a Palestinian who lived under the occupation, can even imagine himself what does it mean to live under the Israeli occupation. Not in times of war, not now in Gaza, 
the routine of the last 56, 57 years. What does it mean to be a young student in Ramallah, in Jenin, in Hebron, not to speak about Gaza? None of us can even imagine it. Nothing, no jail, no bloodshed, just a routine life. Just your dignity, which is worth nothing. Just your life, which are the cheapest product in, in Israel, the life of a Palestinian. Just the humiliations, just the, the, the arrogance, the brutality of penetrating into your home in the middle of the night with dogs for nothing, just to spread more terror and more fear among population on a very, very routine basis. I'm not speaking about times like now. Times like now, the world is calling Israel the only democracy in the Middle East. Do you know that right now there are over 5,000 Palestinians from the West Bank who are in jail without trial? We never had such figures. I, I don't remember, it's, maybe it's 4,000. But unprecedented number of people without, jail, without trial in jail. How do you call a regime which, which sends thousands of people to jail without trial? How do you call this regime? Can it be called democracy? How do you call such a regime if it, if it sends only one of the two peoples under its government to jail in this way? Can it call otherwise but apartheid? How else can it be called? I'd be happy to hear from you if there is an alternative name for this. I'm not speaking about the fate of the the kidnapped or arrested or detained people from Gaza, in which conditions Israel is keeping them. Did you know that 38 cases of deaths were already in Israel jail ever since this war started? All of them killed either by violence or by lack of medical treatment. And nothing. Even those things which should shock any Israeli concerning his own country. Nothing. You cannot penetrate this iron wall of indifference to the fate of the other. I could go on and go on, but I'm very interested also in some kind of dialogue with you. I'm always accused that I never leave room for optimism in my lectures, which is true. I cannot fake. But I can tell you only two things which are not very convincing, I know. But because we are really right now in the lowest point ever, and the most depressing mo moment ever, it was never, never going so bad in terms of the Israeli society. Not to speak about the second Nakba that the Palestinians are going through. But they have even to mention it. So I can tell you that usually the darkest part of the night is the part before dawn. I don't know if it convinces you, but I'm trying. <laughs> I can tell you that would we all meet in the late 80s, and I would have told you that within months, Apartheid in South Africa will fall, the Berlin Wall will fall, and Soviet Russia will fall. You would have never invited me again here, because you would have thought that this man is a lunatic. Nobody had foreseen it coming. Nobody. Soviet Russia, this strong Soviet Russia, the apartheid system, the Berlin Wall, I was so convinced that the Germans would never get reunited again. And it happened. And it happened quite easily, out of the Because many times you see a strong tree falling all of a sudden, and then you look inside the tree and you see how rotten it was. And there are very few things which are more rotten than the Israeli apartheid and occupation. And if this is not enough for you to be a little bit more hopeful, I can just tell you that we believe, I believe in the Middle East, one should be realistic enough to believe in miracles. And miracles is exactly what we need now. 
I can't draw here any optimistic logic scenario for the coming years in which some kind of justice will prevail, some kind of equality will prevail, and that the Palestinians will get at least some of the rights which they deserve so much. Thank you very much. I just want to start with, um, I think, something you referenced in your, in your speech about the sort of Israeli peace camp. And I'm going to broaden that out to the Israeli left, or perhaps the center left, or even the center. Um, I don't need to tell you about the fact that um, in opinion polling, even though Netanyahu personally is very unpopular, um, broadly right of center or even right wing parties <coughs> continue to do very well. Um, but you worked for Shimon Peres for four years, and I just want to know, was there an, an authentic Israeli left that was committed to the idea of two states and coexistence that we think of when we think of Ebi Barak, Taba, Camp David, Ebi Lomert, or was it always an illusion? At the time, I believe there is. When I look backwards, I'm totally convinced there was never a real intention to go for the two-state solution. Even not for a moment. Oslo and all those peace processes and the peace, peace negotiations and the peace plans, they had only one goal, to gain time. And Israel wanted to gain time in order to strengthen the occupation. How do I know? Take from them and the Oslo they were very promising. I, I, I was part of the euphoria around the Oslo reports. I really thought that we are facing a change. One thing was not even mentioned in the Oslo reports. The settlements. And the fact that Israel was never even ready to even stop the settlements, not only evacuate them, but even to stop them, and ever since then we tripled the settlements is the best indication that Israel never meant seriously a two-state solution. Because if you mean to evacuate those territories and to make it into a Palestinian state, then you don't build another terrace in the, in the, in the <coughs> occupied territories. Yeah? But Israel was very clear about it. We will continue. And Israel tripled the number of settlers ever since Oslo. So there is no bigger bluff than the Israeli Zionist left, which I was part of. It is really maybe the, the, the biggest lies in Israeli politics, and therefore, by the way, I prefer the right-wingers over them. Because at least with the right-wingers, you know what you get. Now, the Israeli left in the last years has a new flag, Netanyahu. If we just get rid of this demon, Israel will turn into a paradise. Let's fight Netanyahu. And they go to the streets and they write, I cannot read those articles again and again, giving him all the curses in the world, which all of them he deserves, yes? But to concentrate, to focus only on Netanyahu means that there is one small problem in Israel, it's called, it's called Netanyahu. Once we fix this, Everything will be wonderful. So I, I was never part of this campaign, only not Netanyahu, Wak no Bibi, only not Bibi, because I knew that I have to think also who is the alternative. The world is now dying to see Netanyahu going away. And then what will we get? We'll get Benny Gantz, another general, much less intelligent than Netanyahu, much much less gifted, will we'll we'll agree on all the things that Netanyahu said about the war, will continue the same policy whatsoever. Yes, Israel will be a more pleasant place to live under another prime minister. Because Netanyahu has really destroyed so many, so many layers in Israeli society, and he has to go, no doubt. But don't have any expectations that any replacement to Netanyahu will change one of the three core issues. The apartheid, the occupation, and the war in Gaza. This will continue exactly the same. 
exactly no change. Yes, Benny Gantz will go to meet a bus in Ramallah, and he might even, might in a very good day, offer another peace conference, and the Americans will be in love with Benny Gantz and hug him, and the West will hug him, and the EU will hug him, and the UK will hug him, and it will be really a beginning of a new era. And then you realize you're the same. So, by the end of the day, don't forget also that the socialists, the labor, the center, the center of Israel, the, the, the left Zionists, whatever you call them, they are the founding father of, fathers of the, of the occupation. They are the founding fathers of the settlement uh, project. You, my dear, you, the name you just mentioned, Shimon Peres, the late Shimon Peres, is responsible to many more settlements than Benjamin Netanyahu. He started this whole project. So the problem is that we don't have an alternative and therefore I'm so pessimistic about Israel changing by itself. There is no one to lead the change, there is no motivation, there is a collaborator called the Israeli media and it will not come from there. And then if that's true, how does this stage of fighting end? How, if it, I mean, it must end eventually, surely. Is there a hostage deal? Is there a ah, this, this, this phase now. This particular phase. Even if this phase will end, we will not solve anything. Right now, nobody knows how to get out of it. Nobody knows how to get out of it. Because if Israel, if Israel goes out now from Gaza, Right now, there are two possibilities. Either Hamas goes on with its policies that everything is as it was before the war, or Gaza turns into a Somalia. I don't know which one is worse than which, but it doesn't solve anything. Don't forget the West Bank, which I hardly uh, mentioned here. By the time that all the eyes of the world are in Gaza, in the West Bank, there is a revolution that most of the world doesn't pay attention to it, or not enough. Because the violence of the settlers, and this I can follow much, I'm covering the occupation for so many years, but to Gaza I can't go in the last 16, 17 years, but to the West Bank I, I travel every week, and the settlers take over there. Irreversible things are happening there, under the cover of the war, because nobody cares. The violence, the, it's unbelievable what's going on in the West Bank. So, who is going to stop all this? None of the candidates right now, the potential candidates, as they look now, people might go through a change, as they look now, none of them is going to bring really a new message. And Israel needs a restart. And without a real restart, nothing will change. I don't see anyone taking this. Could you talk a bit more about this idea of the most moral army in the world? How did it start? How is it, is it sustained in Israel? Especially in the framework of this ongoing conflict? Try to tell an Israeli, try it once, <laughs> to tell him that the Israeli army is the second most moral army in the world. <laughs> <laughs> that Luxembourg has a more, uh, maybe more Luxembourg doesn't have an army at all. I don't know what, which country has a more moral army than Israel. He will be so offended. How dare you? Israelis are really convinced. And this shows you how irrational is the whole thinking and how deep is the brain brainwash system. Because they really believe that if you say that you are very careful in implementing the international law in Gaza, and if you say that you do anything possible to prevent killings of, of civilians and innocent people, then it's enough. That's a sign that you are very moral. Then they say, listen, you know, many times I try to argue with people from my camp, 40 people in, in Nusrat last time. Immediately the Israeli will immediately say, yeah, but there were terrorists there. A, he doesn't know if they were. B, there is no limit. You can kill 10,000 people for one terrorist. It will be still perceived in Israel as a justified operation. And this didn't start in this war. Nothing started in this war. It just got much bigger 
and stronger in this war so much that you can't even argue about it. A few years ago you could put some question marks. Is it really so moral? Today you can't even raise this question. You cannot raise the question if Israel, is a moral, Israel has a moral arm. Because this is like asking, is it, uh, is it Thursday today? I mean, there is no other answer. Professor Schlein. Thank you, Gideon, for coming to talk to us. Um, and you are like a, fre a breath of fresh air. Uh, but I would like to take, and I share your analysis and I share your pessimism about Israeli society. But I'd like to uh, question one assertion that you made, and that is that nine, that uh, seven of October marked a, a fundamental change in Israeli society, that it was a turning point in Israel's history. And I'd like to suggest that uh, as far as self-righteousness is concerned, this was not a fundamental break, but a continuity, uh, a, new, a new level of Israeli self-righteousness, which was always there. And for me, Golda Meir personifies Israeli self-righteousness, particularly her saying, which is not so well known as her claim that there is no such a thing as a Palestinian people. Golda Meir said, all the wars against us have nothing to do with us. All the wars against us have nothing to do with us. And in this respect, uh, the Israeli response to 7 October um, is part of a continuity rather than change. First of all, I totally agree, and I'll say, but I cannot miss this opportunity to, go to, to mention here two more quotes of Golda Meir, which is as lovely as the one that you mentioned. <laughs> this lovely lady once said that we will never forgive the Palestinians for forcing us to kill their children. <laughs> and this lovely lady said once that after the Holocaust, the Jews have the right to do whatever they want. And she reflected in all those expressions something much deeper, which is a consensus in Israel. I don't think she said something that other Israelis didn't share. Everyone thinks so. Under the skin of every Israeli are those beliefs. Not to speak about the fact that we are the chosen people, not to speak about the fact that we are the victims of the world because of the Holocaust and many other things. But you are totally right that it is a continuous, but something went out, went out of the closet in, on the 7th. It's not that it wasn't there, but now it's totally out of the closet. Now it's totally clear. Racism was before. Hatred toward the Palestinians was before. But now it became totally politi politically correct. No room to even apologize about it. Racism is now the political correctness of Israel. It was never the point. We tried to show another face. We tried to claim all kinds of wrong claims and, and part of them lies. But now it's all outside. And this is the change I made. And the second change, which I can't ignore, even though it is doubtful, the fact that the last remains of the Israeli peace camp, no, at least the Zionist peace camp, were totally smashed and trashed in this, in this, uh, in this day. I agree that it shows how not solid it was from the first place, but now it's very clear. No one is left here even to to try something else. And I, I can feel it on a daily basis with my best friends how they speak different now, how they feel different. The last, and then there were small remains of, of, of this before, but now they are all gone, and they don't come back. I don't see them. It's eight months now. I don't see any shit. Usually, Israel supports any war in its beginning, like the Lebanon war. But then, after a few months, people start to have their doubts. No doubts. Now. 
If you're a student, if you could just say your name and your call. I just want to say one word about Avishlein, because yeah. there is a group of Israelis which were the real pioneers, which came to this discourse much before me. And they, and they paid much a bigger price than, that, than I paid personally. And Avi Shlem is one of them. I don't want to mention other names, but there are a few really people who were so courageous, who paid much a bigger price than me. And Avi Shlem is one of them. So, thank you. your name and your college fees, I could just go to you, if you are a student. Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Adam, and I'm a student, a graduate student at Green Templeton College. And to mention, you said you're not going to mention other names, but to mention some other voices and writings that sound a lot like yours, uh, and thank you so much for your talk, I think of sort of former liberal Zionists who have more recently become one-staters, people like Peter Beinart in the States, Mira Sukhrov in Canada, Avram Berg in Israel, uh, Daniel Levy here in the UK. And all of them speak very, very strongly about the need for sort of equal rights, but also the need for representation of both Palestinians and Israeli Jews as national and collective groups. We've seen encampments and protests with Palestinian flags, and we've seen in Israel and to a lesser extent in the world, Israeli flags as well. I haven't seen, I don't know if you've seen any civil society movement that flies both Palestinian and Israeli flags. I wanted to ask what your, how you look at not the last, the latest tragedy in Gaza, but not the last six months or even the next six months, but the future of the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. And are there two nations there? How can that be expressed in Israel-Palestine? And how can the rest of the world support sort of national identity in addition to individual rights? I understand now is the part of the Simple questions. Exactly. <laughs> You're very tired. <laughs> I try to be brief because this is another lecture, obviously. For many years, I really truly believed in the two states of mind. I thought if two peoples are struggling over one piece of land, they should divide this land. And, uh, and I thought that's the most just compromise. It is a compromise for the Palestinians more than the, for the Israelis because they feel the whole land belongs to them but many Israelis feel the whole land, land belongs to them. I thought this will be the best solution. There was only one problem with this, not a major problem, but the problem, this train left the station a long time ago, and usually trains don't come back home. With 700,000 settlers in the West Bank, there is no room for a Palestinian state. And there is no Israeli statesman, and there will never be, I believe, an Israeli statesman who will be powerful enough to evacuating 700,000 settlers from the West Bank because the settlers are the strongest power group in Israeli politics. They are blackmailing all the governments, not only the right-wing governments, also the central, central governments. I don't see them being evacuated. If someone can come with a, with, with a plan to evacuate all of them, there is no Palestinian viable state without their evacuation. You will find all kinds of experts will tell you we will build tunnels and bridges and they will stay and they will walk on, on bridges over the Jewish settlements. It will be a bent of study. It will not solve anything. I, I must say here just as, uh, something that in Israel is totally unaccepted. One of the conditions of Israel is that the Palestinian state must be demilitarized. And I ask here, where from do you have the right to ask the Palestinian state will be demilitarized? Why Israel is demilitarized? What is this chutzpah, yeah? this arrogance that you have the right to possess any weapon in the world and they will never have the right to possess anything to protect themselves? Mm -hmm. Who is going to protect this state? Mm -hmm. But let's put this aside because we are not there. There is no room for a two-state solution. And then, and after three visits in the South Africa or so, really here I had all, I all of a sudden saw the light, and the light is very far away, but at least there is a light. And this is obviously the two-state, the one-state solution. 
We are living in a one state now for 56, 57 years. It's a one state between the river and the sea. Only Israel dominates everyone. A guy in Jenin and the guy in Gaza and the guy in Jerusalem and the guy in Tel Aviv is under Israeli control. And as under Israeli government, military or democratic, but that's the rule. We are all living in one state. The only struggle from now on, I believe, should be to change the regime of this state. It's not far-fetched to believe in it. It is a good way to go. I know that right now it looks unthinkable. But many unthinkable can take place. We have to start with something. The way that the world continues to speak about the two-state solution, the United States, the Palestinian Authority, the EU, and even parts of Israeli left, has only one goal, to gain more time. We have a solution on the shelf, and one day we'll take it and use it. But it's not there, and we are wasting our time on this. It will never be implemented. You know, if an American president say, I can do it, go ahead, but do it. Don't talk about it. Continue the discourse only with the, the two-state solution. is playing to the hand of the occupation because I believe it will never happen. On the other hand, changing the regime. One person, one vote. Equal rights to everyone between the river and the sea is something that should penetrate the international discourse first as a goal. Because I think that for the long run, that's the only vision. Equal rights, one person, one vote, nothing but this. Let the settlers stay there. Let's not talk about boundaries, because we'll never find any agreement about the boundaries. Let's make it a democratic <coughs> state. And the Israelis will have to choose. They, they think that they can have it all, but they will not be able to have it all forever. And when this will happen, they will have to give up the dream of a Jewish state. So sorry. If you wanted to live in a Jewish state, which I don't know what's the meaning of it, but if you want to live in a Jewish state, you have to give up the occupied territories. You can, cannot have it all. And the one state will solve many things. It's many years to go, but we have to start to talk about it. I'm Amnaji uh, from Napier College and from Adachan in Golan Heights. Thank you so much for your talk. My question is about your role in the Israeli media landscape. So you've painted an extremely depressing picture of Israeli society right now, but obviously you're still writing your column every week in one of the biggest newspapers in Israel. And so my question is what impact do you think your coverage has had before October 7th and after October 7th? Do you feel like you're kind of just screaming into the void, or do you think that your coverage is making some sort of change within Israel? Uh, it's a whisper in the darkness. Totally irrelevant, totally unimportant. I don't even do what, know why I do it. But I can't do anything else. I thought to move into car business or... <laughs> didn't work. If there is an effect, and I doubt it very much, it's not in the Israeli society. My great, great luck is not only that I have this platform of Haaretz, which supports me and tenants, many times even defends me, but the fact that Haaretz is also translated into English. That's really my blessing. But I have very, very little faith in, in the Israeli reader. I, I feel that uh, there, the influence is really zero, and why should I speak? Everything which happens in Israel is exactly against what I call for. So what kind of influence do I have? Nothing good, sir. Thank you very much. I'm Max from uh, Black School of Government, I was a student. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for particularly for your observation of the current state of the Israeli society. I have a question about the diaspora and the Israelis living abroad and the Jewish society abroad. Uh, is there like, some room for their 
influence to the Israeli society? Uh, what do you think about it? First of all, the Jewish community all over the world is not one over. Far of being monolithic, very diverse and very good. So, part of the mainly the establishment shows many years ago to identify totally and blindly with Israel. No matter what Israel is doing, we support Israel. Mainly the American lobby, the Jewish lobby in the United States, many well-established organizations, conservative organizations, also the Jewish establishment in this country. It's a blind support, an automatic support to Israel, no matter what Israel does. Now they complain about anti-Semitism. But you identified with this. It was your choice to say whatever Israel is doing is holy. And we are behind Israel. If you are behind Israel, you have to pay for it now. Because Israel is doing very, very bad things. But the good thing is that there is a new generation, mainly in the United States, but also in this country and many other countries. And they can have a crucial role. First of all, you'll be surprised in the fact <coughs> that anti-Semitism, which as I said before exists, just show that there are other Jews to, to, to convince, I don't know if you can convince, but to make a saying, no, we are Jewish and we are anti-Zionist. It is legitimate. Zionism is just an ideology like any other ideology. We don't support this ideology. For us, Zionism, like for me today, has only one meaning today. Jewish supremacy between the river and the sea. And anyone who is in favor of supremacy of one people over the other can be a Zionist. Anyone who doesn't believe in this cannot be a Zionist today. I'm sorry. Secondly, in the United States, it can have an enormous impact for the long run if the, the Jewish establishment and donors will stop supporting uh, so-called Israel's friends. But who is Israel's friend today? The biggest anti-Semites. And that's so strange. And if you look at the world, who is there to be friend of Israel? The biggest anti-Semite. So the Jewish communities can have a role but we shouldn't see them as one entity, by far. And that's very good news. You discriminate your deputy, <laughs> so I'll take my, my uh, position and you will be the other. Because it's important. No, no. One more, because she, she is, ah, she's not your deputy. You are not his deputy. No, but she's I'm a student journalist. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. So to whom did you give the right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm George from St. Catherine's College. I'm an undergrad here. Um, so when it becomes obvious that within Israeli society, especially that apartheid is so um, easily seen, like Route 4370, Ashraf the Street in Hebron, um, even today when we see things like the Jerusalem Flag Day marches, where even Ben Gavir was there himself, how do you, if you see a one-state solution as the solution? How do you see the conciliation of both sides? Because of the amount of, as you said earlier, the brainwashing within society, how do you see the conciliation uh, like, to bring the two people together when there is so much institutionalised hate between the people? I mean, I've seen talks about how the, uh, the talk, like the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide was, um, was talked about and how post apartheid South Africa, but when it's been institutionalised for so, such a long time, how would you say that that would be dealt with? Again, I, won't, I don't want to create an impression that it is around the corner or that it is easy or guaranteed. I just say, from all the alternatives, the very few alternatives we have, we have right now three alternatives, an apartheid state, a two-state solution, or a democracy. As I think, a two-state solution is totally off the table, so it's either an apartheid state or a democracy. I don't see any other approach. Now, about hatred and about all those dangers, first of all, the whole mindset must change. You don't judge the future according to the present. Yes, according to the present, there is no chance for it. 
Jews and, and, and the Palestinians will never live together, they will slaughter each other, it will never work. But the idea is to change the, the present in order to have a new future. You cannot judge it according to the conditions right now. The conditions must change. I'll ask you a question. Would you believe in the year of 1945 that Germany and France will become allies? Would anyone believe it? Would you believe that Germany will be the best friend of Israel or the second best friend of Israel in 1945? Would you see, you know, what hatred was toward Nazi Germany? And people quite easily. I remember when Sadat came over. We hated him. He was described in Israeli media and society as, as really as another Hitler. And within weeks, restaurants were named on his name in Tel Aviv. He became a hero within weeks. No matter what, what is left from all this, but what I want to say is that it's much easier to forget hates, hatreds than it seems now. But it will be a long way to go. Look, we are living together now. It's not an equal life. It's not a safe life for most peoples. But you see examples in which it is working. There are some islands in which it is working much better than in Ireland, for example. There are, I don't want to get into details because the time is short, but there are many examples in which Palestinians and Israelis, even in the current reality, are collaborating together. On a daily life, not about politics, about very daily life, there are some cities like Haifa, which is a mixed city. I don't want to say it's ideal, but people are living together. They are quite, I don't think that Jews and Palestinians will fall in love within two years or three years and, and all the problems will be over. There will be always resistance, there will be always bloodshed, but less and less, I hope, if there will be some kind of justice. We need, first of all, to create some kind of justice and then we'll see if it's working or not. But in the current situation in which there is no justice whatsoever and no equality whatsoever, what do you expect to happen? And still, I don't guarantee anything. Maybe we are doomed to live in an apartheid state forever. Maybe Israel will be strong enough, and the world will be impotent enough, and this will continue forever. Maybe? Sorry? I promised her, and you can take it. <laughs> Um, so Biden's re recently spoken about his latest kind of peace proposal, and he's gotten a lot of criticism um, for saying that it's endorsed by the Israeli government when a large amount of the Israeli cabinet has publicly stated they oppose uh, kind of ceasefire and his peace proposal. Do you think this proposal has a chance of passing, or do you think it's another example of a kind of contradictory American executive policy um, that's kind of going to get shut down? Very simple question. I said it from the first day. I don't see any chance for this. Netanyahu doesn't want to stop this war, period. He will find all kinds of ways to prolong this war, to continue this war. And the Israeli public opinion is still supporting the idea that we shouldn't stop the war. They want very much the hostages, obviously, naturally, humanly, but not in any price. And the price of ending the war, and it's not only ending the war, it's pulling out the troops from, from Gaza. When you say ending the war, it means pulling out from Gaza. Otherwise, the war will continue, because as long as there will be soldiers, Israeli soldiers in Gaza, there will be resistance, and as long as there is resistance, the war will, will, will continue in many other forms. There is no genuine intention by Israel to put an end to this war, and therefore I don't see anything happening. There is a good intention from the Americans, but they do nothing about it, for God's sake. <coughs> I, I mean, either you really mean it, so do something about it. And if you don't mean it, stop all those ridiculous trials. It's, it's really, even for the dignity of the President of the, of the United States, you cannot be the President of the United States and say, 
tell Israel, if you enter Rafa, I stop the arms, and a day later, Israel is in Rafa, and the arms are, are keep on coming to Israel. You don't do it. All right. Well, on that somber, but very realistic note, <laughs> join me in thanking you for your time.